so glad you've joined us today. This program is brought to you by Loma Linda University's Risk Management Department, the Living Whole Wellness Program. We have a great, great speaker for you today. His name is Rich Priest, and he is basically one of our wonderful therapists here in our employee and student assistance programs here at Loma Linda University Health. And he's been with us for one year. So um, he is enthusiastic and you're gonna really enjoy his presentation today. Life is difficult. Perhaps you are a single mom with a couple of kids working full time as a housekeeper in the medical center. And it's difficult just to make all those ends come together, all those ends meet. To add to the difficulty, you're also in school full time to become a nurse. And keeping all those plates spinning is just not easy, especially when the children inevitably get sick at the worst possible time. For example, on the night before you have a major exam, they're getting sick. So life can just really be difficult. Now, maybe your experience is that you are a, in the midst of a, a newly blended family. And what you couldn't see when, before you moved the two families under the same roof is that her parenting style and your parenting style are like polar opposites. And now there's all this stress coming because your kids are complaining about her kids and what they get away with and so forth and so on. And life is just difficult. Or perhaps you find yourself in a marriage that once was very, very intimate. You know, the proverbial long walks in the park and those lingering conversations over dinner. But now it just feels like there's this gap, this distance that's growing between you, and all your efforts to try to bridge that gap seem to lead him to pull away even further, and you're ready to pull your hair out. Life is difficult. Maybe you bought your dream home six months ago, but now your wife has lost her job and finding another one with an equal amount of pay doesn't seem like it's likely to happen anytime soon. And so you're really, both of you are stressing out over the reality that, you know, how are we gonna make all the bills be covered without this additional income with this new mortgage? Life is difficult. And all these difficulties of life inevitably lead to a lot of stress. And all these stresses in life lead to a lot of physical and emotional challenges. Things like high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, depression. And I'm sure that it's just not real easy to say, oh, well, you know, let's just get rid of the stress in our lives. Much easier said than done because stress is the norm. It's not the exception, it's not the rare occasion. It's something that happens to all of us much of the time. And so with all these difficulties in life and all these stresses in life causing all these physical challenges, how do we solve this? Well, you might be interested in a podcast I watched a while back by a health psychologist uh, by the name of Kelly McGonigal, Dr. Kelly McGonigal. And in her podcast, or in her um, TED Talk, actually, not a podcast, in her TED Talk, she shares the fact that for many years, as a health psychologist, she railed against stress. I mean, in every chance she got, in any presentation she gave, and in her private practice, she would rail against, because stress, you know, it's a killer. It causes all these problems, high blood pressure, cancer, diabetes, etc. In recent years, Dr. McGonigal has come across some research, some data, some studies that point to something fascinating that she'd never known before about the effects of stress. And that is that when two simple factors are present, that all the negative effects of stress, not just are reduced, but they're gone. They're like drained away. In other words, with these two factors in place, 
You can endure an enormous amount of stress, enormous amount of difficulty, problem, challenges in your life without the negative effects. Want to know what they are? The first is deep and meaningful relationships. Deep, meaningful relationships. Now, it doesn't mean you have to have a hundred friends. It doesn't mean that. It simply means that the one or two or two or three friends that you do have, you have a meaningful relationship with. In other words, you're talking about more than sports and the weather. You're talking about the stuff of life. You're talking about the challenges in life. You're talking about the problems and challenges that you are currently dealing with. Now, it shouldn't be a big surprise that relationships would be one of these two factors that mitigates the negative impact of stress, because as one of my heroes once wrote, Dr. Larry Crabb, a psychologist and best-selling author, we are not messed up psyches who need insight and information. We are, at our core, disconnected souls that need connection. You see, it's love that heals us. It's relationship, it's connection that brings the healing. And with connection in place, with a high amount of relationships, it's one of the factors that mitigates the negative impact of stress. Now, what's the other? And that is a deep sense of meaning and purpose. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to experience this principle right in my own life when I lost my job. Now, it would have been so easy to slip into a depression. It would have been easy to just be beating up on myself and thinking about the mistakes that I had made and so forth and so on. But early on, there was some evidence, which don't have time to go into all those details, but early on there was some evidence that led me to a growing conviction that this job loss was part of a bigger plan. In other words, it wasn't just about the mistakes I had made, which I definitely made some, I definitely contributed to the challenge, but it was also about a, a higher plan. God had plans for me, and this job loss was part of those plans. And I gotta tell you, it's now been a number of years later, and looking back, I am so grateful for that job loss, because it led to so many amazing things in my life that probably would not have been there had I not gone through that experience. So when we have a deep, meaningful relationships in our lives, and when we have a deep sense of meaning and purpose, all the negative effects of stress drain away. So the question I'd like to wrestle with now is how can we inculcate these two principles, high amount of relationship and meaning and purpose, into our work environment here at Loma Linda. How can we do that? Whether we're in the medical center or the behavioral medical center, East Campus Hospital, or the university itself, how can we bring these two experiences, these two factors that mitigate the negative effect of stress into our experience? And there's a number of um, business leaders and so-called you know, gurus going around the nation these days that are pointing out that we can actually do this in the workplace. And in fact, that the workplace, in a sense, can become our extended family. You know, it's probably been 100 years since most Americans lived on farms interconnected with their biological extended families. You know, in those days, uh, we often worked with our fathers and our grandfathers, and a couple of uncles were probably just down the road, not very far, and, and everybody knew everybody, and everybody was in everybody's business, and by the way, that was a good thing, because there was always somebody to talk to. If you couldn't connect with your father, couldn't connect with your, your brother, you could probably connect with an uncle, someone, or an aunt. Someone was always there. But that's been gone for a lot of decades. And what some of these business leaders are suggesting is that the workplace can become your extended family. One of these individuals is uh, Michael Lee Stallard. Michael Stallard. And in his book, Connection Culture, Michael identifies three kinds of cultures in the workplace. The first is a culture of control. 
Now, I think most of us have been there. We know what that feels like, <laughs> to be in a place where everybody's kind of nervous and there's a lot of fear because, and, and very little innovation because everybody's kind of scared. Culture of control. The second that he identifies as a culture of indifference. And this is where nobody tries to connect with anyone at work. You know, I just show up, I do my job, go home, get my paycheck. It doesn't matter that you're in the desk next, next to me. You're, I'm indifferent to you, you're indifferent to me. The third culture though, which is the one that he recommends, is a culture of connection. And Michael points out that when there is a culture of connection in a work environment, everything changes. Let me give you just one example from his book, uh, Connection Culture. It comes from the rock band YouTube. Perhaps you've heard of them. Perhaps you enjoy their music. Perhaps you've heard of their lead uh, songwriter and vocalist, uh, Bono, who is becoming as well known for his philanthropy as he is for his music. And the truth is, uh, for the entire history of the band, long before they ever won their 22 Grammy Awards or had you know, a, a record-breaking concert tour, uh, Bono had been inculcating into the band a deep sense of meaning and purpose. They had always worked for higher causes, higher than simply commercial success or you know, lots of revenue or just the music. It was always about social justice and other causes. In addition, Bono had always worked hard to develop a sense of connection and connectedness and community among the band uh, players. One of the ways that happened was early on when they were still teenagers. I mean, they started so many years ago. They're in Dublin, Ireland. And um, early on in their experience, the drummer lost his mother. Now, it turns out that Bono had lost his mom two years before. So he knew something about what it was like to go through that kind of loss. So Bono was able to be there for his drummer and support him in that process. Other bandmates over the years have gone through challenges as well. Uh, on one occasion, when they were about to perform a concert, their bass player, Adam is his name, showed up completely stoned and unable to perform. Now, in a lesser group with a lesser sense of connection, that might have been grounds for dismissal from the whole band, but not, not you two. They found someone else to play the bass for that particular concert, and then they rallied around Larry, uh, excuse me, Adam, rallied around Adam to get him into rehab, get him through the process that he needed so that he could become free from alcohol and drug abuse. It wasn't too long after that took place, after Adam was sober, that they were campaigning, uh, they were joining the campaign here in the U.S. for the U.S. Congress to enact a new law, uh, enact a new uh, holiday based on Martin Luther King. And Bono had actually written a song honoring uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. But before he was able to perform it, the group received a death threat. That if they were to go ahead and perform this concert and sing that song, that Bono would be shot. And the FBI investigated, determined that it was a credible threat. Bono and his band talked it over. But remember, they had a higher purpose. This wasn't just about music or commercial success. So they determined to plow ahead. As Bono began to sing that particular song, he couldn't help but close his eyes. And he didn't open them until after one of the verses. And when he opened them, he looked up to see Adam, that formerly drug-addicted bandmate, who had moved from his normal position and was now standing directly in front of Bono, as if to say to the world, look, if you're going to take a shot at my leader, you're going to have to go through me. Now, folks, that is a sense of connection. That is a culture of connection, and that is a group with meaning and purpose. Wouldn't it be awesome if here at Loma Linda University, we could develop as much of a sense of meaning and purpose and a culture of connection as much as this rock band has done? You know, Jesus once said, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another.
Wouldn't it be awesome if we could develop that kind of connection so that everybody that works here had a sense that they truly were loved and cared about and a deep sense of meaning and purpose? What a powerful story that was of, the, of you two that I've never heard before. So we have some questions. So if you have any questions, please type them in because Richie is here to answer them. So we have one that's actually a very good one too, is how can you try to infuse a culture of connection when the culture is one of control, specifically when you're not the one in charge? Mm. That is exactly what I'm going to address in the rest of the talk. <laughs> so I, I'd be happy to answer okay. it, but I'd be stealing from my own you know, presentation. Okay, so stay so, tuned. Yeah, yeah, stay yes. tuned on that one. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you asked that. It's a great question. Stay tuned. So with this, can you actually go from one of connectedness and go backwards to one of control? And how do you stop that from happening? I'm not a business expert, mm -hmm. but from what I've seen, um, it's always easy for things to disintegrate. You know, entropy is a law of, you know, of physics, and it's, uh, it's a law of life as well. And so I think it's always easier to go back to uh, that culture of control, because control is so much, uh, you know, if, you, if you're in control, you're making sure everything's the way it ought to be. Mm -hmm. It's scary to not be always in control. It's scary to let other people have say and input and whatnot. It's a much better way to live, and I think the organization will be in much better shape but it is easy, yeah, so I think it definitely can happen. Mm -hmm. Are there any, I, for lack of a better word, metrics sure. to know you're backsliding, to stop you? I would simply suggest that, that leaders can check in with the people they work with. Mm -hmm. You know, just ask, how, how's it going? you know, in our office. How do you feel about things? It doesn't mean that you're letting go of your leadership mantle or becoming, you know, someone underneath everyone, but you're, you're taking kind of a one down position, which I think is often very wise, and saying, you know, give me some feedback. How are things going here? Do you feel connected here? If not, why not? Tell me about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Another question, I want to go back to the earlier part of the presentation where you talked about stress. Mm. And stress definitely will weigh on you mind and body, like you, you know, yes. mentioned here. Yes. And if we can start doing these two things, which is a great action that we mm -hmm. can do. Mm -hmm. And there are questions that I get, and I want to pose it to you because I think a lot of people have, have thought about this. When is it time to ask a therapist for help when it comes mm. to stress? When do I know that I'm? this is a healthy type of stress that I can handle it mm -hmm. through working through the connection and the relationships and meaning and purpose? When is it that point? Is there a point? Sure, yeah, I mm -hmm. think there is. Um, when the stress in your life is causing problems in your life, that's when you need to go get some help. In other words, you can have an enormous amount of stress. You know, th this whole idea that um, uh, traumatic experiences and terrible losses and whatnot automatically leads to PTSD uh, is, is just totally wrong. Mm -hmm. Most of the time it actually leads to growth. But when you find yourself heading down a different path, when you find yourself um, with some, some serious negative effects in your life, you know, when you find yourself irritated all the time, and your spouse is saying, you know, you're always irritated. <laughs> you, know? Um, you know, that might be a clue. When you find yourself uh, depressed more often than not, we all get down from time to time. But when you find that's kind of becoming chronic, that would be another clue. So basically, when the stress is messing up your life in some way, that would be when I would suggest, yeah, come in, sit down with one of us. We'd love to talk with you. Okay. And could I mention, that therapy mm -hmm. is not only for severe problems. <laughs> so how do, how do we convey that? Yeah. Well, you know, something I, <clears throat> I often tell my clients is, we're all a little crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's just, that's just the reality. Uh -huh. You know, I, I, I've often said that, you know, I, I've often said to my own children, mm -hmm. look, your mother and I have done everything we can to make you as dysfunctional as possible. Now go find a good shrink and work it all out. <laughs> We're all a little crazy. It's just that some of us summon the courage to admit it. Um, this notion that only a few people need therapy, I think we could all benefit from that. And um, so, you know. And we have to get rid of the stigma because everybody can benefit. 
and I think the stigma is there because going to therapy is admitting you have a need. And that's always scary. What's fascinating, though, uh, Dr. Brene Brown has done some research on vulnerability, in fact, a lot of research on it. And she, she will ask people, how do you feel when somebody admits a weakness or a problem in their lives? And the responses are inevitably positive. Like, oh, I admire that person. Wow, look at their courage. But nobody in her research wants to be the person hmm. being vulnerable. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Yeah. But a therapist can also help you make these connections better and find meaning and purpose, definitely, too. Definitely, definitely. So we have some other questions. What is the defining characteristics of a control culture versus a connection culture? Mm. Well, that's a good question. Very good question. Um, first of all, in a control culture, there's not a lot of um, camaraderie. There's not a lot of shared responsibility. Uh, one person's in control, and mm -hmm. it's very clear that that person is in control, and everybody else just kind of does what they're told. Mm -hmm. So in order to develop a culture of connection, it really helps to have a director or, or leader, whoever the leader is, take a little more of a one-down position um, and, and share some of that you know, responsibility and whatnot. Now, I do believe, and I'll share more about this in the latter part of my mm -hmm. talk, that any of us, and I don't care where we are on the, on the scale of things, whether we're you know, uh, the dean of one of the schools mm -hmm. or whether we are, say, um, you know, a, a housekeeper in the mm -hmm. medical center, I think we can influence the organization toward a culture of connection simply by how we relate to people. And I'll talk about that in a couple minutes. Okay. Well, let's not wait. Let's get right to it. All right. Well, here's what I'd like to um, wrestle with for the next few minutes is what can you do? You may be saying to yourself, look, I'm, I'm not the dean of one of the schools. I'm not even a physician. Uh, I'm certainly not a department head. Uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not any of those important so-called positions. I, I'm, I'm just a certified nurse assistant, or I'm a housekeeper, or I'm a patient representative in the medical center. Well, what can I do? Maybe I'm just a medical student, you know, and I feel like I'm at the bottom of the heap sometimes. What can I do to create a different environment? And the first thing that you can do is you can choose to bring a positive attitude to your work environment. I like to put it this way. If it's helpful, you can even close your eyes and just imagine the kind of person you would like to work alongside. Whether you're a nurse in the hospital or a housekeeper, whatever you are, what kind of a person would you like to work alongside? And then be that kind of person. Be the person you would like to work with. Now, I'm sure some of you are saying, okay, but you can't just reach inside and conjure up this marvelous, joyful demeanor. I mean, you know, how do you do that? Well, fortunately, and I wish I had more time on this, but fortunately, uh, Dr. Brene Brown has done a lot of research on where joy comes from. And what she's discovered, it, it, not surprising, I, I think you'll, uh, it'll make sense to you when I share it. What she's discovered is that joy is inextricably connected with gratitude. Gratitude, it turns out, is the pathway to joy. Gratitude is the pathway. So in other words, well, you're, you're exactly right when you, when you say, you know, I can't just conjure up joy. That's right. But what you can do is you can focus on the things that you are thankful for. I encourage people to literally make a list every night before they go to bed of three things they're thankful for. And every night come up with three new things. The very effort it takes to notice the things in your life that you appreciate changes your demeanor. It retrains the brain to notice the positive and be grateful for them. And in Dr. Brene Brown's research, she's found that those two are inextricably connected. She never found someone with, someone with joy that did not have gratitude. And gratitude is something you can work on and focus on. So you can bring a positive attitude to your experience at work. You can be the employee you'd like to work alongside. You can bring that happy disposition. You can also use your character strengths 
to create meaning in what might be otherwise a meaningless job. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, let me give you an example. This comes from Dr. Martin Seligman, one of my heroes in life, and uh, he's the one that developed uh, the whole, or helped to develop the whole field of positive psychology. Dr. Martin Seligman tells about a young graduate student who was working in a grocery store bagging groceries. I think we can all picture that kind of scene and realize that could be a pretty boring job, you know. Uh, the first hour or two, maybe not so bad, but after that it gets pretty boring. And she was totally bored. But she went to the website that Dr. Martin Seligman and his associates have set up, AuthenticHappiness.org, and it, you can set up a free account, and, um, and you can take what's called the Survey of Character Strengths. And that's what this young graduate student did. And she discovered in taking this uh, Survey of Character Strengths that two of her top strengths were social intelligence, and playfulness and humor. So what she decided to do is to take those two strengths and use them in an attempt to make the time she had, even though, though it might only be a minute, minute and a half, with each customer, and attempt to make that minute the high point of that customer's day. Now, as you can imagine, she's not always gonna succeed at that. But as I hope you can also imagine, the boredom of doing those groceries completely went away. And she was focused on adding value to those customers' lives. She was focused on making a difference in their lives. This brought meaning to her life. So I would suggest there are these two things that you can do. You can bring a positive attitude to the workplace. And you can use your character strengths to create meaning in a job that might otherwise be meaningless. What would it be like if all across this campus, all sorts of individuals, whether they consider themselves important individuals or less important individuals or in between important individuals, what if all across this campus people were bringing that positive attitude, choosing to be the kind of joyful, happy person that they would love to work alongside? And what if they were also finding out what their character strengths are, and then using those to find meaning in their work. What difference could that make all across this campus? What might it do to further the whole plan here of making man whole? Richie, thank you so much. So what I love about it is there's something we can do, mm -hmm. number one, and there's something we can do together. Yes, Not definitely together. Wonderful. So we have a question that came in. How does faith inform a culture in the workplace? Oh, wow. Um, I think in, it, it can inform it in several ways. I mean, for example, the, um, the verse that I quoted, uh, I would love to see us, and, and I'm not saying we aren't striving for that, but I would love for us to really take those words really seriously. You know, Jesus said, by this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. What would it be like if we really strove for that? That's a place where I think faith can inform the culture. And you don't have to be a Christian to value the idea of showing care for one another. Because love is another word for really caring about each other. So that, that would be one example. Uh, I think another would be, I mean, for most of us who are spiritual people um, of one sort or another, we tend to find our, our source of meaning and purpose in a higher power. Um, and, and that makes a huge difference, you know, so that there's a sense of, this is more than just, you know, dollars and cents and, you know, meeting a bottom line. Right, right. What's interesting about your talk to me that kind of impressed me is that we're talking about the workplace now. How can I yes. make my professional life mm -hmm. better? Yes. However, the concepts that you talked about really can be beneficial in your personal life as well, correct? Oh, I would, I would definitely think so. Uh, because, you know, we all have uh, stresses in our lives. I mean, the first part of my talk, I was trying to build a case that mm -hmm. all of us have stress, not just the exception. And so, yeah, whether or not you're able to inculcate this at work, which I think you can, mm -hmm. um, even if you're not a leader, you know, 
but you can certainly inculcate it in your personal life, uh, you know, to find that sense of meaning and purpose. In fact, you know, it's one of the things that, um, you know, I'd love to work with people on uh, at the EAP is, mm -hmm. is talking with people about finding that purpose. So, yeah, I definitely think that would no, be I think that's great. And this AuthenticHappiness.org, that's yes. really neat. It is. How can you use that in your personal life? Well, it's helpful to discover what your character strengths are uh, and in your personal life to utilize those character strengths, to know what they are. Uh, for example, uh, with a lot of my clients, one of their goals in therapy is to build a better sense of self-esteem a better sense of their own identity. Mm -hmm. A very common challenge. I, you know, we all struggle. I certainly have struggled with it. And one of the things I've discovered over the years is that most of us can see our weaknesses. It's our strengths that are difficult to see. Mm -hmm. And so by taking that survey of character strengths, it enables us to begin to see not just our, our, our mistakes. It's good to see mm -hmm. our, our weaknesses and own them, but it allows us to begin to see our glory. Hmm. Glory that I believe God created into every one of us. That's great, because I'm seeing that this could be a tool that we do as departments. Sure. You know, to see each other's strengths mm -hmm. in this way, and I can see this, my husband and I doing it as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, thank you for the resources and thank you for this excellent presentation. We uh, hopefully each of you will feel more connected um, to the topic now and think, well, that's something I can do too. Um, so with that being said, I want to thank Richie Priest for being here today. In addition, I would like to let you know that you can visit us anytime on our website and watch these videos on demand. We have Wellness Live on demand and you can go there every day of the week and watch some really great speakers. Now, next month is February. It is Heart Health Month and we have a wonderful speaker for you. His name is Dr. Anthony Hilliard and you don't want to miss this. So with that being said, I want to say thank you so much for joining us here on Wellness Live. My name is Dr. Olivia Moses and see you next time.